Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And uh, to start off with, we have uh, John Moore, and he has some important reports. He'll be here just for a segment. So, John, tell us all the latest news and, of course, the great announcement about Professor McCanny. Well, I, I talked to uh, Professor McCanny earlier today. He's agreed to come on with you, Dr. Deagle, and, and do some interviews. And uh, I think it would be uh, good for your audience and good for everybody when, when that happens. Um, so I'll be getting the two of you in touch with each other over the next couple of days. Yeah, um, by the way, he's uh, the uh, first scientist to deal with the plasma universe and the danger that comets and asteroids are highly charged objects that cause effects on plasma-based objects like our planet and the sun. He's also um, one of the top uh, people that deal with the issues such as the approach of the a nemesis dwarf star we call uh, the, the red dwarf star coming into our inner solar system in the next number of, of uh, months or years. Uh, and the plasma effects on that, on the sun activity and coronal mass ejections, et cetera. Right. So he's right. an expert he's, on that. He's the scientist, uh, the only scientist that's gone public with the kind of credentials that he has. Every other scientist with the kind of credentials he has is not talking about it publicly. Right. So that's a, that's, a, that's a big bonus for all of us. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move on to some uh, other things. My uh, guy inside Department of Homeland Security has got his hands on a 500-page manual that gives instructions on uh, how the Mexican and Canadian armed forces, possibly other armed forces, foreign forces, will be conducting checkpoints and uh, taking control of our interstate highway system. Uh, I expect to get my hands on that 500-page uh, manual on CD in the next week to 10 days or so. Uh, in addition, uh, we've got reports that the 101st Airborne has been put on alert and uh, will is being prepared to conduct military operations inside the United States with no specific date given. And on top of that, uh, multiple reports still focusing on the second and third week of October as possible times when something could happen, a uh, dirty nuke be set off, a financial collapse. And those there's no specific time frame other than the second or third week of October, possibly just before the election, possibly just after the election. We're, we're kind of at a loss as to any specific time frame, uh, but we're all, you know, we keep uh, our fingers in the pie and, and keep checking with our sources. The closer we get to the event, Dr. Bill, the more people have to know about it just for purely logistical reasons. Right. Uh, once we get to within 72 hours of the event, there's going to be literally thousands of men and women who are going to be uh, in, the, in the know because... Uh, that's simply the nature of something like that. Uh, so the closer we get to it, the more people are going to find out. And that's why we just keep talking to people and keep the, the lines of communication open so that we can get the immediate word out as quickly as possible. Yeah, we know that the meltdown in Europe, we've talked about this in the last few days, the meltdown in Europe is the riots in Spain and Greece are really reaching a fever pitch. So it's likely we're going to see a... Uh, uh, Spain cannot reach, the, uh, the report I saw this morning was a, that their banks are in debt and, and are not able to service $94 billion of debt. Uh, so we're seeing uh, Europe teeter on the edge. Uh, right. And it, what I would say, if I'd say i put about a 70% chance that there's going to be a bank holiday. It'll be probably very short, five days. But it'll be a restructuring of the world economy, which they can always restructure because it's all on paper. It's all funny money. And well, they'll do that because they're... A bank holiday, if, if the bank holiday <laughs> includes... Credit cards, debit cards, and EBT cards not working, which I very likely would. Uh, right. That will cause complete chaos in the United States. Complete. That's, the, that's what I expect to happen. In other words, if you don't have food storage and water for at least three weeks. You're crazy because you're not listening to us and getting your your ready store, uh, your uh, preparewise.com forward slash Dr. Bill food. If you don't have your food and water and self protection, because people don't realize most people don't only have more than two or three days of food in their home, they're not prepared for the fact that they're. they're Credit cards won't work, and I never drive on less than half a tank of gas. I always re refill it. Should never drive on less than half a tank of gas. Never. That's right. Always never, fill it. Never. Ever. And I tell people never, never, ever. never, 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 never. And, and you know, if you can get stabilized gas cans and put it in your garage and keep on recycling these and putting it in your tank, good. But you don't understand that they, they want to use this as a means to further what I call remodel society by what I call crisis management. They create crises, then they have their particular solution for it. And uh, right. we're not preparing for that at all. Um, uh, and I, I suspect I suspect that we're going to see increased coronal mass ejections, increased volcanism, increased earth changes are going to have a major effect. Uh, what else is Dr. McCandy saying, or what are you saying on your show, which is 7 to 9 a.m., Monday to Friday on Republic Radio, Central right. Standard Time? What are the major stories that you're following? 
Well, uh, Professor McCanny is talking about a comet. It's uh, the designation of it is Charlie 2012 Sierra 1. It's C2012 S1. Uh, he says it'll be 15 times brighter than the moon and will be visible in the daytime. And its closest passage to Earth would be December 2013. Uh, apparently, the NASA has known about this for some period of time and have, have kept it quiet uh, up until recently. They, I don't know why, but they did. So he's he's watching that, and of course he's watching all these other matters. Uh, and uh, we, we continue to uh, monitor everything that uh, is viable for monitoring. You know, Dr. Bill, I. I get half a dozen emails a day from people claiming to have photographs and video of uh, the, the Planet X uh, Nibiru Wormwood, uh, almost all of which, of course, are are, are uh, not the, the destroyer. Yeah, they're Wormwood. bogus. But uh, when I get my bogus. sources from the Solar Pell Telescope, uh, inside sources from Chandra X-ray Telescope, most people don't realize the radio telescope Arecibo can see these things because they can be seen by radio telescope. Right. They can't be seen by regular visual telescope at all. But they can't be seen by infrared and X-ray. Not, in, not in the visible light spectrum. No, it has to be in no, infrared no. light spectrum or, or other other means. Yeah, uh, exactly. There are but, there are places that are monitoring this, but that 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 information doesn't get out publicly. Right now, the other thing I want to mention too is that uh, we have a number of different aspects. We have this comet that's uh, the asteroid that's coming by next February fifteenth, my birthday. Believe it or not. That's going to be 197 meters. It's going to be within 5,000 miles of Earth. Every time they recalculated, Nan brought this report forward, and maybe you can respond and tell us what about it. Because every time they recalculate, it gets closer and closer, and then all of a sudden, two months ago, they stopped releasing data. So we have that, and then we have this report from this Canadian uh, astronomer from the University of British Columbia, a professor, published an article that an 800 meter asteroid would hit Antarctica in the fall of 2012. And he calculated it was going to hit the the, the Filchner Rhone ice shelf, causing two thirds of the ice in Antarctica to crumble into the sea uh, because of the amount of force, the kinetic force transferred. So, uh, if you look at the article, I'm going to post up a copy of the analysis of this of this article that was published uh, on uh, you know several years ago, uh, and it's, it's come back because people realize that there's a lot of things happening that near our space objects are now classified. The government doesn't want us to know that a lot of time they're missing these objects, number one, and these are not little ones, they're big sucker objects. Some of them right. whizzed by the Earth like a little a year ago, I think we had one at 68,000 miles from Earth that was, uh, you know, I think one quarter of the distance to the moon. That's pretty darn close, and this was a right. big object that could have taken out some place like uh, a chunk of, of Spain or France. So it wouldn't right. be a minor well, thing. And something hitting Antarctica would chuck an awful lot of moisture and ice into the into the ocean, into the air, and would have a major climatic effect on the whole planet. Right, it would. Well, the way we measure ice in the Antarctic is cubic miles. It's hard for uh, most of us to wrap our brain around something that size, mm. you know, one mile on each side, cubic mm. miles of ice. And it's not floating ice like we have in the Arctic. It's, lying, it's ice on top of the water, not floating in the water. So that ice will all contribute to a dramatic increase in ocean levels worldwide. I can't tell you how much it would be, but uh, there's many parts of Florida where we have hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate, 9, 10, and 12 feet above sea level. So uh, it will have a dramatic uh, effect on all low-lying areas worldwide. Right. In fact, this area, this ice field that they're talking about that could be hit, if you hit that one ice field there in uh, Antarctica, and two-thirds of it was actually released, and it melted over a period of, say, three to five years, because it'll take a long time for these ice areas to melt, you could have a rise in sea level of maybe 40, 50 feet, uh, for real. Now, of course, in the long term, we're heading into an ice age, which is going to drop the, the sea level, but in the short term, major impacts like this could cause a, a rapid, relatively over a period of several years, rise in sea level that could devastate a lot of coastal communities. Right, absolutely. Now, Manhattan would be gone. Most of Florida would be gone. Texas, Alabama, Louisiana would all take dramatic, dramatic losses in their real estate. Yeah, major effect. Thank you, John. Amazing report. Back with Thank Andy you. Morrison. Thank you. Have a good show, guys. Yeah, take care. See you next week. Welcome back, and uh, yes, the powers that be are preparing for themselves with underground cities all over the world. 
They're launching one new underground city roughly every seven weeks in the United States. They're being built all over the planet, from China and Russia to countries like North Korea. Uh, people aren't uh, really ready. And, of course, the dialectic of control by the globalists is to create conflict, to create chaos, to create economic chaos. There's no need for it at all, by the way. Uh, remember, our money is just funny money anyway. Our money has always been funny money. Even when you traded so many goats and camels for so much silk along the silk trail, again, that's the closest you can get to real value. The tally sticks we have survived longer than our so-called money system. Gold and silver coins was exchanging, again, a commodity of variable value, even though people valued gold. Uh, what we have right now is a situation where they're going to create an economic chaos in Europe. They want a bank holiday, and they want other chaos, including release of biological weapons, we'll call weaponized flu, which now is on the run, and we're going to have more of that. We have, uh, of course, the drug war, which is really heating up. And, Alexander, you've got some major stories here, and we'll get back to Anne in a second. But, uh, and what's happening uh, in terms of the uh, Louisiana sinkhole and what's going on there, and then we'll hear from Alexander. Uh, what's going on in, in Louisiana? Because this is very dangerous, what's happening at that butane salt uh, dome storage area. Well, they're, they, uh, yeah, they're, they're not, they're claiming that there is no butane being released at the moment. What, the, what happened was that the uh, Texas brine cavern that they had ho hollowed out of the salt dome collapsed from the top. And they're thinking that Texas brine didn't uh, leave enough of a roof. In other words, they started drilling out their cavern too close to the surface of the salt dome. And uh, and so it was uh, jeopardized, and and then it it fell in, and that what the people there were calling earthquakes were really uh, the falling of the debris from the ceiling of the cavern. The salt dome itself was falling into the cavern that Texas Brine had put uh, radioactive drilling equipment into, among other things. And then as a result of that, the water mixed with the salt and made a brine. And uh, it started washing away the the ground, and that's where the sinkhole is. And um, there is a butane pipeline that crosses over through the the sinkhole, and there is also a cavern in the salt dome that contains liquid butane, that is butane at pressure, and um, it's within. 1,500 feet of where the sinkhole is now. The sinkhole grew by 1,500 square feet over the past week. And uh, so um, they're, they're worried about butane. They, their plan right now is to, is to build flaring devices. They're going to put in three flaring devices to burn off uh, any gases or volatiles that are coming out of the sinkhole. However, uh, normally you don't flare butane, you flare methane. And they're saying all they're getting out of there is diesel. Well, you're not going to be able to flare diesel. Diesel, <laughs> diesel is not that volatile. Butane, though, when it, when it gets um, at atmospheric pressure, is very volatile. And even a spark would set it off. And if a spark, if there were butane leaking, in other words, if that, that other close cavern uh, is compromised and butane starts leaking, then uh, it, as it leaks, it will turn from a liquid into a gas. And the gas is very ignitable. And the thought is if it got to the surface and uh, enough of it accumulated and something ignited it, then uh, it would follow the butane trail down to the cavern and blow up the cavern. And that would be equivalent to a thermonuclear explosion except for the radiation and you would get third-degree burns on bare skin 10 miles away. Yeah, wow. That's, yeah, that's they're not amazing. killing the people that. The only people that they, they, they have evacuated 500 homes, and they say that's because they think the homes might fall into the sinkhole. So they're not telling them anything about any flaring of... Mm. I mean, they say they're going to flare the gas, but they're not telling them it might be butane. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Uh, it's interesting that uh, I pulled up another article here about this uh, asteroid. And, of course, you always try to get the uh, other side of the issue. They try to say, well, don't be fooled by the latest web hoax, you know, that this, uh, about this UBC uh -huh. professor that's on this <laughs> website. Uh, <clears throat> first off, when you have an asteroid coming in, you can't calculate that m accurate within that number of years 
so you have to be a little skeptical. But we do know that there's not a lot of asteroids and comets that are coming into our, early into our atmosphere or near the Earth that do put us in danger, not only of affecting us, but causing plasma effects on the planet. And uh, the, the fact is what they, they say that they identify this with a balloon-borne instrument called a BLAST, which uh, UBC is a key player in collecting data over Antarctica, and the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope and its adaptive optics do uh, apply uh, to, to develop very uh, sharp astronomical images. So when he just says this is ridiculous, I think there really is objects that are out there that they don't want the public to know. When it leaks out, they have someone this guy is called Dr. Jamie Matthews. And I'm very suspicious when I see these articles come out. This was just on Saturday, September 22nd of this year. Uh, I, there weren't many, or I think it's because we're now mentioning that this object is out there, that they're now starting to pop up the disinformation op saying, no, no, don't, don't think there's any objects out there. None of them are going past the Earth. You know, even the LaRouche Foundation states that near Earth objects are a major risk to the planet, and that's why we need a consortium of Russian, Chinese, American, Brazilian, and other scientists around the world that are working in conjunction, South African, that are going to work in conjunction, Japanese, to find these objects and to divert them or to warn us just so that we know what's going to happen. But, well, uh, uh, the JPL uh, program was doing very well, and they were getting information from military classified hmm. satellites. But in May, the military said, you can't use our satellite information anymore uh, because the satellites are classified, the data is classified. And so the last, the last estimated trajectory of 2012 DA-14 was done in May, in the middle of May 2011, and it showed impact in February 15, 2013. Yeah. But they're not updating yeah. it because they're not getting any new data from the from the classified uh, military satellites. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Uh, now, Alexander, tell us about what's going on in northern uh, Mexico. What's going on there? Uh, thank you, Ann. Thank you, John. Uh, well, uh, a full-out, uh, full-scale war is about to ignite the northern part of the Mexican territory any day now. Uh, it turns out that the Sinaloa cartel led by Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, uh, according to Forbes, the richest uh, man, uh, one of the richest men in the world, uh, is uh, taking a new stand in the area known as Piedras Negras, Coahuila, this is uh, exactly, you know, uh, southwest of Texas. Um, it's Piedras Negras is a border town, a small border town of uh, about uh, 250,000 uh, Christian, mostly, uh, inhabitants uh, on the border with Eagle Pass. Uh, what had transpired on the 26th of September is uh, something com uh, comparable with Kosovo or Baghdad. Basically, a full-out uh, siege of the city took place by the Zeta cartel. They have been controlling the area for a while now. They control the state police, they control uh, the local police, and they have all residents uh, uh, in their homes uh, sequestered from going outside into the streets until further notice. Uh, we know the special is at the break. I'm finding a lot more stuff now that I get his name right in here. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, when I dug up more information, this uh, dar this uh, uh, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield is actually a, a uh, you can see a biography, etc. I'm trying to find the actual article. It's, it seems to have disappeared. I'm going to see if we can contact uh, Chris Hadfield and see if he actually has it. And why was it pulled uh, from the uh, news? I mean, that sounds very suspicious, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But, you know, Google has a backup of the entire Internet. As soon as something goes up, they have a backup registry of everything that goes up. Yeah. But who can trust Google any day? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Google, of course, is just another branch of the no such agency or NSA. <laughs> well, Eric Schmidt, you know, and their Bilderberg group are real good friends, so, yeah, that, that's why. Yeah, yeah. 
So anyway, um, back to the story on Mexico. I mean, this is really bad, people. Uh, the Zetas even planted a bomb at the International Bridge uh, on, uh, on the American side. Uh, U.S. authorities were on a heightened state of alert uh, on, the, on, the, on the morning of September uh, 28th. Uh, when this happened, uh, civilians are being shot at. We have bazookas flying inside the main streets of uh, Piedras Negras. We have RPGs being uh, used. We have uh, thousands of Zeta soldiers uh, being prepped for what is being called the War of All Wars uh, because they want to position El Chapo Guzman in that region of the country uh, before the new incumbent president takes power on the 1st of December, Enrique Peña Nieto, of the PRI. So basically that's the, 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 the situation over here. The Santa Muerte is their god. As soon as the Zetas took over the town, they put Santa Muerte statues all over the town. Whoever uh, talks about uh, the Santa Muerte in a bad way is either killed or disappeared. They're going into universities, high schools, and... Uh, secondary schools taking all youngsters uh, male uh, and r recruiting them by force into the cartel preparing them to use uh, high-powered rifles in order to prepare for the war of all wars uh, the entire city of Piedras Negras Coahuila at this moment is under a state of siege uh, it's interesting this happened after uh, August before last which is two years ago we had this new agreement between uh, various agencies in America and integration with the uh, federales in, in, the, in Mexico, et cetera. And uh, the drug war really started to kind of amp up. But I mean, it seems to be a drug war against specific cartels and letting other cartels get away with it. So in other words, the American government has been allying with specific groups to make sure the drugs get into the country, and other cartels have been uh, hit basically with our uh, assets, if you want to call it Mexico. That's what I've heard. Well, intelligence assets that we have uh, embedded inside certain uh, hot points uh, or hot spots have told us that, in fact, they want to monopolize the entire drug operation in favor of uh, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. In fact, that is one of the key reasons why Felipe Calderon started this insane uh, uh, drug war in the first place. He wanted to monopolize the business. So uh, that's been well documented by uh, Mexican journalists. Uh, such as Anabel Garcia, who wrote a book uh, called Los Señores del Narco. Uh, and uh, one of the things here that has to be noted is that it's already spilling over the border. And one thing that was noted by our direct contact, whom I interviewed, who lives in Piedras Negras uh, last night, is uh, this person works for the government, told me that it's incredible that the Zetas have better guns and uh, hardware and military cannons they have even uh, protecting the city uh, and not even the elite tactical uh, forces of the state government and the federal government uh, have uh, you know the necessary armament to take them on yeah that's pretty amazing these have advanced weapons yeah and where uh, are the guns coming <clears throat> from I mean uh, they're coming from the United States, and they're coming from the best, uh, you know, uh, gun salesmen in in uh, Monaco, you know, once a year. So uh, the, the things are getting really bad. The Zetas are scared because well, they why know do you think that they're doing? Uh, why do you think the U.S. government is not only allowing this because Hillary Clinton's directly involved? Why do you think they're promoting it, allowing this, pushing it? Because they want the border to uh, to go into uh, a total uh, scenario of war. Uh, we've talked about it before. Yeah, I believe well, that the, the, the why idea do you think that is so? such, yeah. Why do you think a total uh, scenario of war? Why why is that? Well, uh, for something called uh, the Northern Command or the occupation, the military occupation by the Pentagon yeah. of Mexico. By the way, I pulled up an article here on our on our scientist, and I actually got a picture of Chris Hadfield. Astronaut Chris Hadfield speaks at a press conference in the Canadian Space Agency headquarters in. Longueuil, Quebec, Thursday, September 2nd, 2010. That's two years ago, September. And it was on CTV News. So uh, I believe this story is real. And I think what happens is you get tapped on the shoulder, do not release this information because we, we want to make it classified. So it, it's my gut feeling that this uh, information about an imp approaching asteroid, they could be wrong in terms of their calculation about where it's going to hit. But an 800-meter asteroid, if it strikes anywhere on the planet, will cause major climatic changes, and they'll be very catastrophic immediately. And the most likely place it's going to hit water because the Earth is 75% water. 
uh, or if it's the ice shelf, say, of Greenland or Antarctica. If it does that, you're going to have a mass release of, of ice and water. And that, of course, rainfall will, no, number one, push us into an ice age. Number two, uh, at least in the short term, it probably will cause a, a massive increase in, uh, in water levels along the coastal areas. So I've actually got a picture of them here. And, uh, and I'm going to quote some of, the, of this article. It says, Canadian and American astronauts say the world needs to prepare for the big one, the asteroid impact that could one day devastate the Earth. Veteran Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield is president of the Association of Space Explorers, which has prepared a detailed report on the asteroid threat. The United Nations is currently studying the report, which outlines plan to detect and deflect any objects in space that might threaten the planet. Now, I worked as a civilian doctor taking care of employees working at Space Command in the mid-90s, and I happen to know that we put in many hundreds of billions of dollars, not just little money, big money, uh, perhaps trillions, into these projects. And we have all kinds of space-based weapon platforms, all kinds of you know Tesla-based weapon systems, rockets, all kinds of spacecraft, etc. that are far more advanced than the Tinker Toy uh, space shuttle. They're involved basically in near-Earth objects. We literally move satellites, communication and military satellites, out of the way of debris as big as your thumb, and they can detect this from thousands of miles away. And uh, the fact is we're moving into a debris field at the galactic plane where the chances of an asteroid strike on the Earth are somewhere around 30 times higher than it was at any other time before now, the last 15 years, and it's increasing. And if any of these objects approach the Earth, um, even if they don't strike it, we're likely to see major plasma effects on the under, under oceanic volcanism, earthquakes, earth changes like the sinkholes, and the plasma effects in the sun causing coronal mass ejection. So uh, I think this story is real. When I do my, I call it the sniff test, and I actually see pictures and see this guy talking about this, I believe they, they kind of bunked him on the head and said, no, don't talk anymore about this. So and also the, the, the report is uh, very technical in nature. Uh, yeah, they talk about the specifics about how they identified it using blast and using, uh, you know, the blast uh, at, at McMurdo Station, what's called the balloon uh, born Large Aperture Submillimeter Telescope, or BLAST, at McMurdo. And by the way, I took care of employees also working at McMurdo when I was in Colorado Springs. Uh, also, at, 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 we took care of those employees. And I know that the uh, Canada, France, and Hawaii have a telescope in Mauna Kea uh, with the adaptive optics bonnet supplies that provide very sharp images. So I know that from my contacts also in the South Pole Telescope, SPT, and these other sources that uh, the globalists and the powers that be are panicked over space weather, and they really are freaked out by what could happen to the planet, so they're preparing themselves. But they're not telling the public because they don't want us to interfere with their continuity of government. Well, what continuity of government in the way? Well, they want, to, they want to survive. They want to be like the Eloi and the Mor Morlocks. They want to be like the Morlocks underground, come out 80,000 years after the destruction of the planet. Yeah, Dune. Yeah, Mad well, Mad. the uh, time machine. Remember H.G. Wells' the time machine? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Believe it or not, people say, oh, that can't happen. I said, well, I'm sorry, you're living in a, you know, remember now, the Earth is a nuclear reactor spinning as a ball with a thin blue line of air surrounded by a magnetic field to protect us from the seething cauldron of interstellar space that is seething with radiation. Welcome back, and uh, yeah, the more we research this, the more it has it passes the smell test. The uh, when we actually look for uh, Chris Hadfield, he's actually no longer at UBC. The doctor that makes a statement against uh, what uh, Mr. Chris Had, uh, scientist Chris Hadfield stated, Jamie uh, Matthews, is it? Yeah, Jamie Matthews. Uh, is from UBC, and this obviously has what, what I'd say is don't believe anything until you see a strong and and well-organized cover-up of the facts uh, because they're launching the Neosat uh, satellite in Canada that was supposed to be launched uh, this coming uh, next March 2013. Uh, they know these near-Earth objects are of great risk um, to the planet, and the Canadian government is putting up a satellite that's going to be about 700 kilometers above the Earth that's going to pick up all kinds of debris and data. The Americans have put up many, many satellites. They have all kinds of space agency uh, assets that are actually watching these objects. And then when they, they, they did this, here it is. Uh, yeah, I see I see you sent me some links there. Uh, Astronomy-linked web hoax. You know, it says uh, 
Uh, here it is. UBC Astronomy Link web hoax. You sent me that link there. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, don't be fooled by the latest web hoax. UBC Astronomy Link to web hoax. So, of course, this is uh, one at the University of British Columbia. And Jamie Matthews, I saw this article. And when I actually looked at it, and I looked at the reports from the news media where, where uh, Chris Hadfield actually talked about nearest objects, etc., and, and Chris Hadfield's no longer on the staff because you actually do a search for his name there on the staff, he's not there anymore. That tells me that the University of British Columbia covered it up and that they actually had Jamie Matthews make statements to say that it wasn't real. Well, first off, we know the Earth objects are increasing dramatically, and we know that the government classified it in May. So my guess is combined with Earth changes like sinkholes, the change in the magnetic field, and, and you have some information on that because the magnetic field is changing a lot faster than people expected. And I think some of the very high ultraviolet readings we're getting this summer are caused by the changes in the magnetic field where the ozone layer is thinning enough that we're actually getting major changes in the ultraviolet light that are causing damage to crops. Uh, high UV ratings are like 12, 13. They've never been seen before. Well, I have information that I think about the ozone hole that was created over Greenland. Are right, and that one, you, you presented that information that they purposely released nanoparticle aluminum that caused a massive ozone hole over Greenland, and that was very dangerous because it actually let UV light in. And when UV light, by the way, strikes uh, ice, it converts it to infrared heat in the ice, and it actually can cause deeper cracking and fracturing of ice, creating a surface lake-like effect that can refreeze. But it had an effect that was almost immediate, wasn't it? Oh, they have pictures that are only four uh, days <clears throat> apart taken by satellite. And on the, on the one that was taken uh, the first, that you could see the ice cap on Greenland. And on the one that was taken four days later, there was no ice cap on Greenland. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, it had changed state from solid to liquid. Yeah. I mean, it was still there. They just, you know, it's just that their camera didn't see it. Yeah. Yeah, here's a comment by Jamie Matthews. He says, the rest is ridiculous blast. He talked about the two, uh, three, the, the two things that are true, which is about blast in, in which UBC is a key partner, and number two, the Canada-France-Hawaiian telescope and its adaptive optics do obtain superbly sharp astronomical images. The rest is ridiculous. Blast cannot detect asteroids, uh, which isn't true, by the way. Well, yes, it, yes, it's true, but uh, it contradicts the statement from the uh, the quote from the original article. I just sent you a secondary <coughs> link. Uh, right. Uh, that talks about the NEOSAT, the Near Earth Object Surveillance Satellite, that it is used for detecting asteroids. Right, and this is actually, uh, yeah, in fact, I've got the uh, near the Microsat Systems Canada Inc. Yeah. And the, uh, so it's contradictory. In other words, it tells you that they're purposely trying to make sure the public doesn't know and don't believe anything to see a major cover-up. Now, why is this important? Because I believe that uh, despite the plans of mice and men like Robbie Burns, the, uh, the uh, poet and author from Scotland, the plans of mice and men gain after glay. And in Gaelic, that means uh, often go astray. And uh, we're, going, we're dealing with a situation where the globalists are scrambling like rats trying to get off, like Norwegian sea rats trying to get off the boat. They want to survive. They want to thrive. They want to, because they know earth changes are coming, and they can see uh, galactic and cosmic changes happening that uh, they don't want to be the victims. They don't care about the rest of the population. That's why they're creating financial catastrophe, so they can you rule us by chaos. They're not preparing the population to say, hey, you need to have your crops grown under some kind of uh, tarps or other thing to protect it from UV light. Uh, they're not talking about massive storage of food for a time when famine, just like ancient e Egypt, where, you know, Joseph came to the pharaoh and said, you know, I'm going to give you the interpretation of your dream, which came to the pharaoh, and had to tell him his dream as well, and told him that the seven fat years and lean years were meaning you're going to have a famine. Well, I would say if you get a major disruption of the climate, a uh, major disruption of the ozone layer, you're going to have famine, which is more destructive of the population of Earth than almost anything except the thermonuclear war. And, uh, you know, these things are very real, and I believe they're already starting to happen. It's not like, oh, maybe that's a theory. Uh, the crazy climate changes that occurred this summer, the thinning of the ozone layer is now happening. So we're not prophesying this. We're actually reporting it to you as it's happening. So when we look at this article here, NEOSAT, Nearest uh, Object Surveillance Satellite, and I'll post up the link, weighing in at 65 kilograms of dual-use, $12 million missions builds Canada's expertise to compact microsat design. Known as the Asteroid Hunter, 
MSCI's innovative Neosat microsatellite would enable Canada to launch a telescope without precedent abilities to track asteroids in Earth's orbit. I mean, this all fits exactly. And guess who is tied directly to the Neosat program? It is Chris Hatfield. Exactly. And in 2010, they <coughs> launched this uh, super small satellite, which is basically just monitors, uh, and it's solar powered and everything. It's very yeah. Uh, an yeah, it launched it apparently in 2010. Upon the success of the most microsatellite and higher orbit space surveillance, HEOS and nearest uh, space surveillance, which is the nearest uh, observation. Uh, this looks. Uh, this story has, as I said, passes a smell test. I think it's real. Now I don't know if they can calculate the exact trajectory of the asteroid that's going to strike a specific area of Antarctica, but an 800 meter sa- asteroid, if it strikes anywhere in the Antarctic Ocean, the Antarctica, anywhere in the Pacific Ocean, or whatever. It's going to cause massive effects in terms of water effects and tsunamis. The tsunami from an asteroid strike like that would be, you know, could be very big. You know, we're talking about 800 meters or larger. Okay, now you're talking about that going into the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean? Yeah, yeah the, if you have an object coming in at 50,000 miles an hour and it strikes the Pacific Ocean, you could easily create a tsunami that could be, uh, you know, very high. In other words, it could devastate coastal areas from for you know all across the Pacific Ocean. So, I think it would take about a day for it to reach North America. Oh yeah, you'd have advanced warning, but uh, people would be scrambling to get away from the coast because who knows if depending on how high it is and what the topography is, the east coast areas where this might strike, uh, if it was in say the lower uh, you know uh, South Atlantic Ocean, would take a day or so to strike there, but what happened is it could go easily 100 more mi- or miles inland. You're talking so, like in uh, North Carolina. Yeah, or it struck anywhere in, the, in anywhere in the South Atlantic. These uh, waves would could be if they if they were if they were say 800 feet high in South America, they could be three or 400 feet high in uh, hitting the coast of the Eastern Atlantic. And if it was in the Pacific Ocean, I mean, who knows how big? You could probably calculate out based on the kinetic energy and a displacement, and I'm sure that the Tsunami Research Centers in San Jose, California, if we contact them, could give us an idea if an asteroid of this size struck somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, uh, which is most likely area. Antarctica, of course, uh, if they're saying they think it's going to hit Antarctica, it's because of the current trajectory is, is making it most likely it'll strike somewhere in Antarctica. So, my guess is these guys have got better data than, than they want to admit it, and that I think it's not a hoax. My guess is it's not a hoax. Well, we always have God on our side who can deflect it whenever he wants. Yeah, but I think what we're going to do is we're going to walk into a cataclysm of a world uh, that's in disruption, that a world that's in depression, a world that where avian swine flu plagues are spreading, a world where the price of gasoline and fuel has gone through the ceiling because we started a war uh, one of the comments that I happen to support Obama on is if Romney says he wants to start the Third World War uh, when he's talking to a Netanyahu, why doesn't he say it? Now, of course, the sneaky snake in the grass, Obama, has already given the go-ahead, but he's told Mr. Netanyahu, don't start it till after I'm elected. I'll have more flexibility, like he said to Mr. Net- Mr. Medvedev of Russia. So well, I don't know how much money is passing under the <coughs> table there, but something's going on. Yeah, uh, Romney is throwing this election, just like uh, McCain. Uh, and McCain could have ripped right through uh, Obama, and uh, Romney basically is playing softball. I don't understand it at all. And, and now that uh, the VP candidate is pro-gay. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Ryan, who looks like uh, he might be. So, so the <laughs> vice president uh, candidate, so bye-bye, Romney. You're just going to be another uh, asterisk in the... Uh, in the 